Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for inviting me. Thanks to It's Nice, that magazine. Um, very happy to be in London because it's the city where I studied. Um, um, I studied graphic design, but eventually became an illustrator and, as mentioned, um, a three-dimensional illustrator. Um, this is um, part of what I do. It's the basically three um, groups of of um, things that I do, which is editorial design, commercial, and self-initiated. I'm really lucky, I think, because um, I can make my living with something that actually doesn't feel like work. It's more that I play around. I have a lot of fun with what I do, and in doing that, I communicate ideas. Um, for magazines, I work um, preferably because I find that it's very good for the intellect and for my mind, but also um, for Telling stories, visual, visually telling stories is for me the best way to express my ideas. Um, commercial advertisement um, has come a bit later in my career and um, probably because it does help um, my account, I do it quite a lot. And self-initiated projects are the ones that keep my soul happy. Um, I try to keep a balance between these three areas and um, keep a humorous approach to all of these. Um, areas. Um, when I started my career approximately 12 years ago, um, three-dimensional illustrator was nothing people really um, knew what it was. So every time I went to a party, I dreaded the question that somebody would say, so what, what do you actually do? And um, because I couldn't say I am a photographer, or I am a graphic designer, I always had to lunge out and um, say, well, I'm a person that um, has a concept, brings out an idea, sells it to a magazine, then does the handicrafted kind of set design and the photographer comes who takes a picture of it. Um, by that time, the other person in the conversation had already left. Um, <laughs> so I really tried to kind of fight my way through these kind of preconceptions of what people had of an illustrator, definitely not only drawing and painting, and try to find my way um, to show people that you can be really multidisciplinary, that you can really um, tackle a lot of disciplines without you know, meaning that you're not really good in one thing. Because that was the biggest problem during my time when I started, that people thought you can't be good at everything. You, you can only be good if you do one thing really well. Um, so I knew I had to go out and ask a magazine to print my story. The first story um, that I printed, um, wait, sorry, I have to go back. Sorry, I love magazines, so um, magazines for me were always really important because I could reach a large audience with um, my idea. And um, in London, I think London really brought out one of the best magazines um, and great talents. One of them was a set designer called Shona Heath, who for me at that time was really like a role model because she brought together ideas, concepts, and set design. I don't know if you know her work, but she does um, a lot of collaborations with Tim Walker. And that kind of um, working together with a photographer and you know, sharing the same energy and bringing your talents together was um, something I wanted to do. And um, apart from her, there were several other great icons of, of art and filmmaking which, I, which inspired me and kind of pushed me forward, which was um, Jacques Tati, the great filmmaker, you probably know, his fantastic movie Playtime, and um, Magritte, obviously, surreal artist, then Martin Parr. So all these figures really played an important role to kind of encourage me to do a humorous visual storytelling. But most of my inspiration comes from my direct surrounding. And um, having studied in London, um, I was really forced into um, going out to the city and going out, meeting people, going to the, like, the source of um, design, which is you know, in your everyday kind of life, and really looking and discovering stories, because they're everywhere. You just have to find them. And um, I'll show you a little slideshow of my um, of the things that I collected and right now I have a huge iPhoto archive and I can always go back and refer to it when I'm sourcing ideas and bringing mood boards together my dog
So this is how it began, and the first story that I um, got published for a Berlin independent magazine was based on one of these findings in my everyday surrounding. Um, on the left, you see an image of a little lost and found notice at St. Martin's College on the pin board, and um, a Japanese student had lost her Vivian Westwood umbrella. And um, the way she was formulating this little notice, you know, with all the passion and all the sadness that, you know, she's no longer in possession of her favorite accessory, um, really made me smile. And I thought, you know, why not continue this idea and make a whole fashion story or accessory story where you're kind of um, inventing stories of the loss and saying something about the person who lost it and also of the product. And this kind of subtle um, product selling um, was something I um, really like to um, execute because obviously magazines don't want to look like a catalog, but actually that's what they're doing, especially fa fashion magazines. And it's gotten really worse um, due to advertisement clients really saying, we, we need to have this in the magazine and this and all these products. So kind of telling a subtle story and still selling a product was um, what I did with this story. And somehow that was the key moment to my career that um, those various disciplines in the story, like telling, writing the story, designing the, the ad, and then also photographing it, looking for locations, getting it printed, it really you know, made me feel like I'm alive. Um, so I continued, and after two or three publications, um, where I went to the magazine and said, hey, look, this is my story, take it or leave it. Um, I got asked by one magazine called Neon in Germany to work part-time in their team. And um, at the beginning, I was reluctant because I wanted to do my thing, but because the issue or the magazine was out freshly, it was the first uh, zero, like the first number, um, I thought, why not you know, shape something that... Um, you can tell all your stories with. And so I was kind of an in-house um, idea machine or in-house illustrator, either working together with others or um, illustrating two or three stories for each issue. And um, I really tried to give my language to this magazine and um, play with uh, metaphors and play with symbolisms. And one great story um, that I really liked was... Um, a survey about our generation, and um, it happened coincidentally. I was just walking into my room or my studio, and on the table were um, a stack of these colored pencils lined up in, uh, in different lengths, and I thought, oh, wow, this actually looks like the, a bar chart, just much nicer. And I discovered that, that bar charts or statistical diagrams are really boring most of the times, and that it was time to do something new. So I approached the chief editors of the magazine and um, presented them the idea. And after a month or so, they gave me a 100-page booklet um, with the whole survey of religious views, opinions, emotions, everything that concerned our generation. And um, I produced it in my studio, in my apartment studio, and um, followed doing this quite a lot of times during my time in the magazine. And um, another popular story, or one that I at least appreciated in the execution, was um, about the perspective or a kind of perception on beauty, um, how this has changed through, the t through time, and especially looking at Renaissance beauty icons and comparing them with today's icons, you know, there's a, just a huge difference. So my idea was very experimental and um, I went out to meet like the best plastic surgeon in Germany called Dr. Mang, who's famous for his nose, which is called the Mang nose. And um, I presented him um, these beautiful Botticelli um, paintings and um, Machiavelli um, noses and asked him to make his notes on what he would, you know, how he would proceed in today's criteria. And I took these and went to the photo retoucher and he did the digital operation. And so you got Mona Lisa more looking like Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> um, so fa after five years I started working as a freelance designer and I started 
going, I started my own studio in Berlin, in the heart of Berlin. And um, I continued the same philosophy, only that I was able to choose which project I wanted to do. And I um, started going out, finding other magazines that I could talk to or that I could, you know, share my language. And um, um, there's so, several criteria for, for taking a brief on or taking a project on, and um, I'm going to go through them quickly. One of them is, as you see here, um, a nice example of conceptual illustration. It's a bit of a mathematical equation that you briefed by the art director saying, you know, we have an essay here about uh, vegetables and fruits becoming very fashionable f or that are very fashionable for one season and the next it's another one. So I kind of took these two themes, fashion and vegetables, and merged them together and the outcome was this vegetable dress. And the time frame was a bit difficult because it had to be executed in three hours, otherwise it wouldn't have looked so nice. Um, the second criteria that makes me um, go for something is um, when the essay I'm giving is so overwhelmingly, magnificently written that um, I'm very inspired just by reading it. And this is one of my favorite essays by Jonathan Franzen for the New York Times, who wrote a fantastic, um, I can send it to you if you want it because I love it so much, but it's an essay about um, the digital times and that um, Facebook and the whole social media have kind of um, um, not, well, have kind of, um, how do you say, well, given us like a substitute for love, that we're not so much loving anymore, but we're much more liking each other and that um, we're really feeding our own narcissism and our own kind of, hey, look at me, I'm so great, and our self-image is being fed by, by these devices. So I created this handheld device with a little USB ending that you can, you know, imaginatively stick into your iPad and mirror yourself. And um, Jonathan Franzen wrote a really nice mail to the editor saying, the piece looked great. I seldom like the art accompanying things of mine, and I liked yours. Thanks for working with me. So that was really um, very great. And another reason to take on projects are you're given a carte blanche. You know, you can do whatever you want, which is actually the most difficult part of the job because you can, you know, you don't have any boundaries and nothing to kind of work yourself in between. You're really in outer space, taking this, taking this on, and it's really important then to concentrate on one subject quickly and kind of go into depth with that. And I tried to do that with um, the issue of McDonald's deforestation tactics in South America and created a McForest. And... Um, some years later, actually, McDonald's asked me to do an advertisement job for them, and I declined. <laughs> and you have to stick to your values, I said. Uh, one very good reason to take on projects is a personal reason that, for example, here I just needed six chairs, and um, I went to a shop. And um, being a big, great fan of barter, um, I deal that I could get six chairs for six QuickTime videos um, that were then put together on a web page. Um, and each character of the chair was reflected in these videos and I shot them, I photographed them in my studio. I had no money obviously because I only got the chairs and um, with my father as my assistant we photographed them and put these little quick time videos together. And this shows quite nicely how important it is to not become too perfect in your work. I mean, sometimes you're forced to do it, and, and then the charm comes by the improvisation. But often, I feel like many artists, the more money they get, the more somehow uncharming their work, and the more perfect it becomes. It doesn't really help sometimes. I, I wonder if there's, or I try to find a way to get a lot of money still, but also keep the little imperfect charm moment. Um, when I agreed to take on a project, I, as, as um, uh, many of you know, we use lots of Google, or as everybody uses lots of Google images, to kind of come up to, with mood boards and sketches, and I try to really give the client or the magazine a very um, precise idea of what I intend to do. And sometimes the result is exactly what I had sketched out, um, for instance, here, um, it's a little fashion story for a children's magazine um, 
where I made the London bus out of like a garderobier um, roll around. But sometimes the opposite happens and the result is not at all what I had in mind. So this is, my idea was to make a lace lungs for a magazine and the art director decided shortly that he needs a nice sexy looking model in his issue and that's how it came together. Um, which also brings um, to the point that I don't use models a lot or rarely ever because I have a tendency to, on the one hand, I'm, I love bringing life into objects, but then on the other hand, if you give me life, then I kill it. So usually all the models look like really like objects, whereas objects look like life. Um, so being prepared for, for productions is also a main part of my work. And um, what actually seemed to be really helpful recently is that I'm really lacking any sort of technical realism. So when I you know, set up my idea, I sometimes have ideas that cannot really be realized in the budget and the time frame and the um, space I have. But that's actually the challenge then to really make it happen. I mean, with this project for Goodyear tires, I nearly killed my assistant because um, the whole stack nearly fell down. We could save it, but still it was, um, you know, if I would have been realistic, I would have said, okay, that's not possible because if you order 20 truck tires, they're gonna be heavy, they're gonna be big, and they're gonna fall over if you stack them on top of each other. So, um, but then I would have had another idea which might not have been as good, and that's why I'm quite happy about not being such a technical expert. Um, and another part of my, my preparation is also, or what I realized what happens is if I'm too over, or like in this example, I was over prepared, and um, what helped me get through the production is you know, letting go and losing control and let other people also be part of your process. And um, I work with a lot of photographers, and I think my work wouldn't be as as what it is if I wouldn't have really great photographers who come up with the idea that actually we can shoot the whole furniture production from the balcony and you can just lie things on the ground, which obviously helps a lot when you don't have to put things on top of each other. Um, when I start production, I really always hope that the client will send me the original material beforehand. Um, here I had a hardware company um, that I had to think of some images for and I love to just have these things lying in my studio and just to play around with them and suddenly something develops from this and often it's just a coincidence and you know just a glance at it and I think ah this actually looks like a skeleton and out of that moment come, came a whole series of images where I transformed these metal heavy metal pieces into evolutionary images, that was the idea, or that was the theme of the, um, the whole campaign was evolution. I think at the end, as you see, the, the tree kind of got under, uh, out of control because we ended having too many doorknobs and you also miss somehow the realism of the whole project. Um, what's great about my job is that I get to shop. I really... <laughs> I'm a very happy shopper, and uh, my tax accountant uh, looks at me in disbelief sometimes when I hand him the receipts for candy, for balloons, or whatever. But I always have very good proof that um, it's all for a professional purpose. Um, the biggest receipt that I ever got was for this Time magazine cover discussing the future of California. and. Um, I, I don't know, each individual bulb on this motherboard was bought, was listed individually, so they really had to open another till when I came along because it was taking forever. And um, this is something that I also always keep um, doing is to have a self-fulfilling material with wish list, as I call it. I really have a list of things or materials that I really want to work with and um, somehow it happens that the right project and the right client come together and then I match material client and that's what I get out of it. Um, sometimes the materials are much harder to find though and it's a bit like playing puzzle that it really needs the right shape and the right size. Obviously I can use Photoshop afterwards or the photographer but I try to keep it as original as possible and really use the 
the real material and the real sizes. And um, I use eBay, flea markets, all that, and always buy double or three, three times the amount to get the right selection together. Um, when producing, um, sometimes a production can take an hour, like this little illustration for Viagra's 50th birthday. And sometimes it can also take up to half a year. Um, this is one of my biggest projects that I ever took on, and it really, yeah, it really challenged me because we had a m really small budget for MS, the French luxury um, uh, company. And um, they really briefed me half a year earlier, and I had to really learn the language of Hermes, which is very exclusive and only best materials and everything. And um, the, I, the, yeah, the reason was that they came to Berlin and opened a shop in a big department store, and so they had these 10 windows to fill. And with each window, they wanted to show their main or one of their great icons, like the bag or boots, the scarves, so on, but also tell a story throughout the whole thing. So I came up with this parade which carried these um, products with them. And I had to rent a new studio space. Um, luckily, something was free in my house or in my studio house, and I recruited some assistants. Um, stupidly, I, I posted an ad on Craigslist uh, looking for assistants for Hermes shop window. <laughs> and then I had like 100 people calling me. And I had 50 interviews, and I think 40 of them didn't even know how to use a glue gun. <clears throat> and so it's really wise to specify your demands um, I don't produce everything myself. I love outsourcing. I love finding people who are better at doing um, certain techniques. Knitting is definitely not one of my passions, and um, I don't have the patience to do it, so I give this to my grandmother who produces it for me. And <clears throat> usually I produce twice. First time is good, second time is much better. Um, but sometimes um, you have to know who you ask <laughs> because this was supposed to be a pair of headphones. Um, <laughs> and it looks a bit different. And I did realize I might not have been the best communicator. And um, it is a skill I'm still working on, communication, um, what you want the outcome to look like. Um, and then simplification is something I love to do, or I have to do sometimes to get the idea across. For instance, this New York Times magazine cover, I, I had intended to use these 150 beautiful colored light bulbs, and I was so in love with the colors and everything, but at the end, the idea didn't work. It didn't sell, it, nobody understood it, so we reduced it and made these nine or 10 different bulbs say, um, you know, thought bubble. And this is another example. The whole day, you know, mapping Copenhagen because of um, a new kind of super highway for bicycles coming out, and then sleeping a night over it, and then coming back to the studio and saying, wait, just one tire in the shape of like a highway with little white stripes actually says everything. Um, so sleeping a night over it is quite helpful sometimes. Um, my favorite projects are the ones where I can get really physical and leave the studio, go out in Berlin, has great space and great places to work a bit more experimental. Uh, a story for a car, story f uh, yeah, for a new car modeled for a magazine. Um, and um, we painted them with different colors and made these great big mono prints. Um, unfortunately, the blue paint didn't go off the white Audi, but um, <laughs> they, they lived with it. Um, paper has become a material I, I love working with a lot too, and um, this is an example of paperwork which kind of derived out of a concept where I was given an essay and um, it was about cooking the perfect chili con carne that you know, you need 99 ingredients to make this chili and you need 48 hours and then it's like the epitome of chili con carne. And I thought, you know, how am I going to illustrate this? And then I thought, yeah, paper is the material that actually has the most perfect um, 
look. So I transformed all of these ingredients into paper and just loved playing with it, you know, rolling it in order to get the leek or um, cutting it into stripes, increasing it to get the minced meat next to the butter. And um, yeah, it was one Sunday in the big hangover to create this image, but it was worth it. And after that, I got a lot of um, requests for making paper art. And um, yeah, I didn't want to, I, then again, I, I was at the point where I thought, okay, now um, Sarah Illenberger is the artist, uh, the paper artist. And I was having same feelings as in the beginning where you're, this pigeonhole pressure thing is really on you. And I um, tried to avoid that by going to Italy and um, visiting some fruit markets and food markets and shopping there and um, playing with the words of certain fruits, like the pomegranate, which I turned into a grenade, hand grenade, or the melon, which I turned into the melancholy in a symbolic way. Didn't really work for all of them, but still I, I had an idea for each one and the ideas were just coming one after the other and I was photographing them myself under the Tuscan sun. And um, I realized how much value it is if, if people are actually you know, living with your work or with your art, that you're not only producing for magazines and um, the red light is on, okay, I'll hurry up. And yeah, living with art, and so hence I opened a little web shop with Tigtail and um, sold my small editions of 20, 25, 50, 100 pictures. And this nice compliment, that's not for me, somebody else made that. I think you can buy for five euros on the Wanda. And um, I think that's a very good sign to be copied, by the way. So my work kind of became, got a new space and I started having exhibitions in um, combination also with a book that came out by Gestalten. Um, this is an exhibition in Tokyo two weeks ago where I made some freestyle paper origami popcorn. And then also setting up my own blog, which obviously everybody does, but it felt more like my digital diary where I can again kind of go back to where I came from um, looking around you and photographing, documenting things that I found inspiring and found um, worthwhile. And so I'm always on the lookout for new ideas and things around me. Thank you. Thank you.